out of fuel and no runway in sight. This plane is going down in the water. I was definitely underwater and the aircraft was rolling to the left. There were bodies, there were people on the floor in the galley. A routine flight out of New York slams down in the Hudson River. At this point, I'm thinking this can't be happening to me. A 767 hijacked, violently forced into the ocean. The most dramatic ditching ever caught on camera. The plane was like tumbling or something. I said, that's it, I'm dead. In the next hour, life and death ordeals in pilots and passengers' own words. The captain just said, brace for impact. Dramatic animations that put you right at the terrifying scenes. An in-depth investigation into why some pilots make the risky decision to put their planes down in the water and how they live to tell the story. When U.S. Airways Flight 1549 went down in the Hudson River, surveillance cameras were only able to capture these remote images of the landing. It's hard to see what really happened. Now, you're looking at the so-called miracle on the Hudson as you've never seen it before. This is a detailed animation of a flight in trouble. In the aviation industry, it's known as ditching, putting a plane down in the water due to an emergency. It's what happens when the nearest open space is not a runway, not even a stretch of open field or a highway, but a body of water. In the case of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, the Hudson River in New York City. Just six minutes before the world-famous splashdown, Flight 1549 is cleared for taxi and takeoff at New York's LaGuardia Airport. First Officer Jeffrey Skiles is at the controls. He's new to the Airbus. For the past eight years, he's flown a Boeing 737. Well, the takeoff was uneventful. It was a nice day. It was cold. And um, this was only my second trip on the airplane, so I was actually hand-flying the airplane to get used to it. And uh, about 3,000 feet, we, you know, flew into the birds. The plane has been in the air less than three minutes when it collides with a flock of Canada geese, crippling both engines. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. It's birds to lost for us on both engines returning back towards LaGuardia. Okay, uh, you need to return to LaGuardia. Turn left heading up uh, 220. Guys, stop you to park. He's got emergency returning. Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger takes control of the airplane from his co-pilot with two simple words, my aircraft. Remarkably, there is footage of the plane's last moments airborne. Sully took over control of the airplane and uh, called for the uh, dual engine failure checklist that we do, and I started to perform that. Trying to get the engines restarted? Yes. Was there any luck at all? No. The engines have to be in a certain start envelope, we call it, to start, and that usually is predicated on you going a lot faster. Captain Sullenberger has nearly 20,000 hours of flight time under his belt, so it doesn't take long for him to do the math and realize at their altitude and rate of descent, it's too risky to try to glide all the way to an airport over such a densely packed area. It's now 3.28 p.m. Flight 1549 has less than two minutes until impact. Air traffic controllers, at times using the wrong flight number, try and guide the plane to an airport. Actually, 1529. We can get it to you. Do you want to try to land 1913? We're unable. We may end up in the office. Right, I can 1549. It's going to be left traffic to runway 31. Unable. Just north of the George Washington Bridge, the captain aligns the Airbus A320 with the Hudson River. He passes the bridge just to the east and continues due south. I looked out the window, saw we were actually below the rooftops of Manhattan. I said, this is not a good sign. We're not making newer. Did Sully look at you and say we're going in the water, or did you both come to the realization that's where this was going? Uh, I think it was more it was just the only option we had. 
There was no, uh, we weren't going to make it to an airport. And that was the only open spot that we saw. If a pilot is forced to ditch, the FAA has recommendations for how to do so. It all comes down to wind and waves or swells. In a perfect world, how would you land on the waves? Depending on the wind and water, I would always want to land parallel to the swells. So if your waves are coming this way, you want to land on the top. You never ever want to be able into, and this is what's called a cross swell, where you're perpendicular into the water this way. What might happen? If you land into the face of the swell, you could actually flip over like this. That's not a good thing. Another potential hazard that could have spelled disaster for Flight 1549 coming down with one wing higher than the other. The airplane could have cartwheeled and that would have been very violent and, and significantly lessened the, uh, the opportunity to get everybody out as, as well as they did. Skyjet 1529, turn right 280, you can land runway right. 1 at Teterboro. We can't do it. Okay, which runway would you like at Teterboro? We're going to be in the Hudson. The captain just said, brace for impact. Help. And everyone started saying prayers, um, just kind of looking at each other, not knowing what to say, what to do. At 3.30 p.m., with wing flaps and slats extended to help slow the plane down, Flight 1549 is about to splash down in the Hudson River. As you watch this unfold, it's everything's just about right. Slow, the nose is up, wings are level, and they've got the good fortune of it being fairly calm. We didn't know if we were hitting water, if we were hitting land, which was what we were better off. Um, and then, you know, the impact hitting the water was just, you know, the most tremendous impact you could imagine. All 155 people on board survived. From bird strike to touchdown, the entire incident lasts just three and a half minutes. Not enough time to get through the dual engine failure checklist, much less a ditching checklist. Also, not enough time to enable what's called the ditch switch, a valve that effectively seals the plane and allows it to float longer. You're not sinking, you're alive. Was there an exhilaration or was there still an adrenaline going on? I'm sure there was an adrenaline rush, I guess. Uh, when we went to the hospital and four hours later, my blood pressure was, I think, 160 over 100, which is, you know, I'm normally a 120 over 70 guy. So obviously there was something going on physiologically that I didn't understand at the time. I am terrific. This is the best day ever. A lot of things went our way. What kind of things went your way? Apparently there are swells a lot on the huds, and it was uh, completely flat that day. And uh, we happened to land right where the ferries go from New Jersey to Manhattan. So that they were right there. They were able to come and rescue us. Other than hitting the birds, everything went our way that day. <laughs> when we come back, bird versus engine. A graphic demonstration shows the startling damage even a small bird can do to an 84-ton jet. And Flight 1549 is not the first commercial jet to be put down in the water. There have been others, some just as successful, others tragically not. In the wake of the ditching of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, a lot of people wonder how a flock of 10-pound birds could incapacitate a jet with a takeoff weight of nearly 170,000 pounds. How could that be? The answer, as large and powerful as jet engines are, they're also surprisingly delicate. This incredible video was shot during a bird strike test run by aircraft engine manufacturer Pratt & Whitney. The birds are dead before the test begins. Watch as the carcasses get shredded as they collide with a turbofan engine. Not a pretty sight. But the engine doesn't fare much better with permanent damage to its hollow titanium fan blades. When a large bird goes in, it, it damages that f the compressor in the front of the airplane. And those blades that break, they just cascade through the rest of the engine. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the bang you heard was not our original problem. There was a large eagle on the uh, runway. Bird strikes are a lot more common than you might think. According to the FAA, there are at least 20 bird strikes a day across the U.S. The problem costs the aviation industry more than $2 billion a year. 
And since 1988, bird strikes have resulted in more than 200 deaths nationwide. Fortunately, there were no human fatalities in the bird strike that forced Flight 1549 into the water. But not all ditchings go that smoothly. Some run into a perfect storm of problems. Imagine a pilot ends up over the Caribbean Sea, out of fuel, out of options, and soon into the ocean. That's the tragic story of ALM Flight 980. But what went so wrong? May 2nd, 1970, in a partnership between two now defunct charter airlines, Dutch carrier ALM and American carrier Overseas National Airlines, ALM Flight 980 is set to leave New York's JFK Airport at 11 a.m. 57 passengers and six crew members are on board. It was a beautiful spring day, temperatures were in the 60s, scattered clouds, light winds. Uh, it was a beautiful day in New York. Flight 980's destination, the Caribbean, Juliana Airport in St. Martin. Pilots say it's one of the trickiest places in the world to land a plane, especially a 747, as this video shows. The postage stamp size runway is perilously close to a beach. Aside from physical limitations of the runway, there's also a mountain range blanketing one side of the airport. And if all that isn't enough, there's that unpredictable Caribbean weather. All those factors combined are about to turn a routine flight into a nightmare. For the first time after four decades, the pilot of that flight, Captain Balsey DeWitt, is telling his dramatic story on American television. As far as uh, an accident being a, change of, a chain of events, this definitely was it. On the ground, Captain DeWitt says he confirms he has enough fuel to make it not only to his destination, but also to an alternate airport in case of a diversion, standard for all commercial flights. He goes through his equipment checklist and discovers the cockpit's PA system isn't working, but that's not required. At 11.14 a.m., the flight is cleared for takeoff. The DC-9 is designed for short, frequent flights, at nearly 1,700 miles, the route from New York to St. Martin will stretch this aircraft to its limit. As the flight heads south, the weather begins to deteriorate. Captain DeWitt is told visibility at the St. Martin airport is below the minimum standard required for landing. He elects to divert to nearby San Juan, Puerto Rico. But 13 minutes later, San Juan Air Traffic Control Center tells him St. Martin Tower wants to talk to him. So I picked up and I tried to get hold of San Martin. I got a hold of San Martin Tower, and all they did was start giving me good, fairly good weather, 1500 broken, etc., which was well above the minimums I needed. I did question them, where did the report come from that you were below minimums? I elected then to refile for San Martin, my original destination, which I did. But as these dramatic animations illustrate, contrary to the information Captain DeWitt says he was given, the weather is terrible. He attempts to land the plane anyway, burning massive quantities of fuel in the process. Visibility was poor, it was raining, and because of those conditions, he had to stay in closer to the airport with the runway than he would normally have liked to have done. So, the first attempt was unsuccessful. So I lined it up with the runway and I took my second circular round. Now on the second attempt, the winds were starting to shift and he was unable to line it up uh, for a landing. So he decided to go around again. On the third attempt, the same conditions existed. However, by now, the winds had shifted 180 degrees. Now he had a tailwind. Because he had a tailwind, the, he, was, he was too high on the approach. So at that point, I told my crew, tell the tower I'm going to my alternate. Calculations showed that they would make it just barely. Uh, they were legal by their calculations, but there wasn't, there wasn't much extra. In hindsight, it's easy to sit and say, well, they should have stopped in Bermuda or they should have stopped on the way down in San Juan. The moment that they missed the runway, it went from fuel critical to a, fuel, a full fuel emergency. When we come back, out of fuel, out of time, and in the water. I was definitely underwater. 
and the aircraft was rolling to the left. May 2nd, 1970. Bad weather, low visibility, and lack of fuel. Captain Balzi DeWitt has no choice but to ditch his plane in the Caribbean Sea. No footage exists of this incident, but our dramatic animation shows what the plane might have looked like as it slammed into those turbulent waters. Here's how the pilot describes what it felt like to be in the cockpit at that life and death moment. My first contact with the water was quite smooth, and uh, it wasn't too long after that that the rest of the airplane was starting to make contact with the water, starting to get heavy drag, that an uh, extreme amount of vibration in the cockpit. The instrument panel was vibrating so that I couldn't even read it. But how did this flight end up in such a dire situation? After failing to land at St. Martin's Juliana Airport in bad weather, Captain DeWitt decides to divert, first to the nearby island of St. Thomas, then to St. Croix, when he finds out it's even closer. But as the plane is climbing away from the airport in a torrential downpour, there's a problem. My navigator said to me, Ballsy, my God, look at the fuel gauges. Because of the wind, the turbulence, and the conditions, the airplane was rocking uh, back and forth as it was climbing. Um, the fuel totalizer was spinning. Yeah, I told him not to worry about it because I considered it was probably a, you know, being uh, low on fuel to begin with, these turbulence and sloshing up down the tanks might, might cause this. But at 6,500 feet, warning lights indicating low fuel pressure illuminate. And Captain DeWitt knows just how grave this situation has become. He talks to the controller, how far are we from St. Thomas? I got five minutes of fuel, I'm not gonna make St. Thomas. I briefed the crew that we will keep going to uh, St. Croix, but we were going to set up for a possible ditching. It's dark, it's over, it's raining, and the sea is real, very angry. A lot of white caps, the swells were quite enormous, and I had heavy winds. All of Captain DeWitt's years of experience are about to come into play. As he descends, he eyeballs the 10 to 15 foot waves and chooses one, knowing full well he has to land on top of it rather than into it, or the plane could break into pieces. Time of impact, 3.49 p.m. Unlike US Airways Flight 1549, which skimmed across the top of the Hudson River, this plane bobs in and out of the waves. Incredibly, Captain DeWitt says the plane continues to function while in the water. The aircraft was rolling to the left and was in already a high degree bank, well beyond 30 to 35 degrees. All I did was start flying it like I would in the air and it, it rolled out level. And a minute it rolled out level, I sort of popped to the surface just like a cork. Not all have survived the impact, but those who do escape into shark infested waters. It's an hour and a half before rescue helicopters begin arriving on the scene. Because the plane's PA system was not working, the pilot never had a chance to verbally warn passengers to put on their seatbelts or brace for impact. 40 of 63 survived. According to the NTSB, fewer lives would have been lost had passengers received adequate warning. Of the 23 who don't make it, two are children. To this day, it's difficult for the pilot to come to terms with a loss of life. Well, the story itself, not very difficult, except uh, if I let my mind wander to the people I lost. Yeah. No, the two kids I lost back there. The final NTSB report on ALM 980, issued nearly a year later in March 1971, reveals a laundry list of all that went wrong that day. Quote, the probable cause of this accident was fuel exhaustion, which resulted from continued unsuccessful attempts to land at St. Martin until insufficient fuel remained to reach an alternate airport. Other factors, reduced visibility, a condition not reported to the flight. I think the biggest thing was that they they kept thinking that they would make it 
uh, and they, they kept doing the, the planning and realizing increasingly that they weren't going to. The airplane, after its second approach into St. Martin, was fuel critical. And to allow a jet to get to be in that fuel critical a state is an error on the part of the crew. There's one thing in this accident that cannot be taken away from me, and I will not let anybody take it away from me. That's the responsibility. I take that. I wore the four stripes. I made all the decisions. Somewhere along the line, I should have been sharp enough to know regardless uh, to get myself into a situation like that. And to this day, I still haven't found where I could have done anything better. Captain DeWitt was fired from his job six weeks after the ditching. He says no official reason was given. He never flew as a pilot again. Coming up next, terrorism in the skies and another dramatic ditching. This one actually caught on camera. When a commercial jet has to make an emergency landing, the hope is to find a nearby runway. But that's not always possible. Sometimes, in a dire situation, ditching a plane in a body of water is the only choice. We've been reporting nail-biting stories of planes that had to do just that. Amazingly, what's often described as a terrifying life-or-death experience for passengers doesn't even seem to phase the man in the cockpit. But there was no fear factor. I had no problems with the crew. Uh, everybody was with me. You know, we had things to do, and uh, I think that makes a big difference. I've always felt that certainly the flight attendants and passengers from back would have had a lot more fear than us because they had nothing to do. Water ditchings are rare, but there have been several more than just Flight 1549 and ALM 980. January 2002, a Boeing 737, operated by Garuda Indonesia Airways, flies into severe thunderstorms, and both engines flame out. After three unsuccessful attempts to restart them, the pilot ditches in a shallow section of an Indonesian river. 59 on board survive. One flight attendant drowns. August 2005, an ATR-72 turboprop fitted with a wrong fuel gauge runs out of fuel and ditches in the Mediterranean Sea off the coast of Sicily. 16 of 39 on board are killed. Seventh airline employees, including mechanics, executives, the pilot and co-pilot, receive prison sentences of up to 10 years. More than half a century ago, there was another ditching, and amazingly, the entire incident is caught on camera. The old Coast Guard film is startling, but it doesn't tell the whole story. This graphic animation shows what it might have looked like if you'd been in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on October 16, 1956, watching Pan Am Flight 943 go down in open water. images are eerily similar to the so-called Miracle on the Hudson, U.S. Airways Flight 1549, but there are also some major differences. It's open ocean, so it's going to be uh, significantly more difficult than, say, a river, just because of the, of the swells and so forth. The differences is that this, they had had hours to plan this. The, uh, the Hudson River uh, crew only had a couple of minutes. Pan Am Flight 943 leaves Honolulu, Hawaii with 31 people on board and 44 crates of canaries in the cargo hold. Known as the Sovereign of the Skies, the Boeing 377 Stratocruiser, a long-range post-war airliner, is bound for San Francisco. This is footage of that actual flight filmed by the Coast Guard. Joanne Marzioli is on board. It was a month before my third birthday. I was with my mother. We were returning to the Bay Area from the Philippines, and my mother was very anxious to get back to California to see my father. But the reunion would be dramatically delayed. 
Several hours into the flight, nowhere near land, the plane is climbing to 21,000 feet when one of its four engines begins to overspeed, its normal hum now becoming a deafening scream. It's the middle of the night and pitch black over the Pacific. They had a problem with the propeller, um, and they created so much drag that they were doing OK with it for a while, and then they ended up having another engine problem that the, the second engine couldn't sustain the high power. It would be a, an unbelievable set of circumstances. Two engines that should be moving the plane forward are now holding it back. It's like driving a car with the emergency brake on. The plane won't make it to San Francisco or back to Hawaii. The pilot, Captain Richard Ogg, quickly determines he has no choice but to ditch in the Pacific. My mother mentioned that she didn't hear any yelling or screaming. She did hear a lot of praying in different languages. The mood was very, very serious. The pilot radios a nearby Coast Guard cutter for assistance, and a plan is formed. The Stratocruiser will circle above the ship for the rest of the night, lightening its fuel load and waiting for daybreak. You want to be as light as you can because uh, when you, with less weight, you can go slower. Uh, and fly it more slowly so the impact with the water is going to be lessened. But also you want to do it with, with uh, daylight because it improves your depth perception. You're going to be able to put the airplane into the water uh, with a better judgment of exactly how high above the water you are. And that, that's going to increase the likelihood of having uh, survivors. Despite a well thought out plan, it is an incredibly dangerous situation. And just like the pilots in our other stories, Captain Ogg is remarkably calm even managing to provide some comic relief, suggesting passengers light their cigarettes and relax. I mean, here he is, he's in a situation where he's gonna to have to ditch the plane, and yet he's able to joke like that. He seems to me to be very calm and have his sensibilities about him, which if you have to have a pilot who's gonna ditch a plane, you'd want a pilot who has his senses about him. The plane remains aloft for nearly five hours, operating on two of its four engines. By morning, conditions are more conducive to ditching. The water is calm. It's a warm 74 degrees. A Coast Guard camera records the scene from below as flight attendants prepare the passengers above, telling them to remove their shoes, tighten their seatbelts, put out their cigarettes, and put on their life vests. The pilot has the crew move all passengers to seats in the front of the cabin. He was probably worried that the tail would break off. And if that was the case, then he wanted to make sure we were all safe in the front of the plane. There's a 10-minute warning, a one-minute warning, and then three simple words from the pilot. This is it. The plane splashes down at a speed of 103 miles per hour. The impact is brutal. The plane whips around, its tail snapping off just as the captain had predicted. When it hit the water, it jarred me apart from my mother, and I slid from under her legs and just slid under the chair. So that was very scary for my mother. I think that was the one time where she did let out a sound, where she did probably scream, um, where's my child? The Coast Guard crew is convinced no one could have survived this. But then, movement. Within seconds, the front doors are thrown open and life rafts thrown out. In the midst of chaos, Joanne is handed off to a Coast Guardsman and then reunited with her mother. Another moment caught on camera. When I saw myself being lifted up out of the life raft uh, by one of the Coast Guards, I, I could picture them just smiling and just being really loving. And then seeing myself on the video put my arm around one of the Coast Guards when I saw my mother looking at me and I reached out for her to see my mother on the video and to see that stressed look. Um, I gotta say that that just really made me think about what happened and what she had to go through. Captain Ogg is the last person off the plane, which sinks 21 minutes after hitting the water. The only casualties, the 3,300 canaries in the cargo hold. Miraculously, all 31 people on board survive. I feel like it's such a miracle. All of us that survived now have lives and were able to create lives. It's
It's a rarity for commercial jets to end up in the water. When they do, passengers rely on a combination of luck, skill, and good judgment in the cockpit. Experience is something you can never buy, and you don't need it often, but when you do, there's no, there's no substitute for it. Still to come, a ditching not caused by birds, weather, or mechanical failure. This is the work of terrorists, and the deadly ordeal is caught on camera. The reply from the pilot, we don't have enough fuel. The response from the hijackers, we don't care. What you're looking at is the most dramatic, most violent ditching ever caught on camera. It's a Boeing 767 slamming down on the Indian Ocean off the east coast of Africa. Unlike the other ditchings we've seen, this one was not caused by mechanical failure, not by weather or even a bird strike. As perilous as those situations were, at least those pilots were able to do their jobs without having to wrestle terrorists in the cockpit. That captain was under a, a different kind of stress than we've seen in these others. Absolutely. Uh, he not only had the, the issues of having to put the airplane in the water, he had people on board that were, that were trying to kill the airplane and everybody on board with it, including himself. It's November 23rd, 1996. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961 from Ethiopia's capital to Nairobi, Kenya should be a routine two-hour flight. It turns out to be anything but. The pilot, Captain Leo Abate, sat with documentary filmmaker Salim Amin, whose father Mo was killed in the crash. In the cockpit of a Boeing 767 simulator, Captain Abate relives the hellish flight. So they came into the cockpit. They came How many the of cockpit. them? There were three of them. They took the fire extinguisher and they started beating the co-pilot. Go out, go out. I said, guys, hold on, what's going on? He said, yeah. shut up, the flight is hijacked. Okay. Claiming to have a bomb, the hijackers demand to be flown to Australia. Okay, guys, I told them, this flight is destined to Nairobi. We don't carry enough fuel to Australia. Let's land in Nairobi. We refuel, and then we can go to Australia. Otherwise, I told them it's impossible. The hijackers refused to allow Captain Abate to refuel at cities along his route. They want him to fly out over the water toward Australia. The pilot knows that's a losing proposition, so he hugs the coast. Then uh, he said, why are you flying along the coast? Australia is somewhere to this direction. And I told him, OK. I turned the heading. And now this message came, fuel, no fuel. Almost out of fuel, the plane approaches the Comoros Islands off Africa's east coast. As the plane descends, the hijackers fight the pilot for control of the plane. I said, guys, this is finished now. We are all dead people now. Let me do it my way. And he said, I don't know how they did it. He uh, disengaged the autopilot. He uh, disengaged it? He did. From, from this control? Yeah, game. from that control. Right. Then I disconnected the autopilot. Then I had to start flying it myself. In the cabin, passengers start to panic. When the pilot first made the announcement that the plane was out of fuel in one engine and running out in the other, the plane just broke into pandemonium. And then we heard passengers in the back who panicked, and they all inflated their life jackets. They all put them on and inflated them. So you could hear this happen. You hear a little pop, 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 pop. In the cockpit, Captain Abati tries as hard as he can to put the plane he nicknamed Zulu down safely onto the water. OK, you have to hold it, hold it, hold it. OK, Zulu, now you're going to make it. Now you'll make it. The 767 is traveling at about 200 miles an hour, far too fast to ditch safely. But there's an even more serious problem. As this incredible video shows, the wings are not level, a dangerous angle for ditching. Watch as the left wing drags along the water with disastrous results. They catch the left wing first. You'll actually see it come off. Um, he's fighting to control the airplane. The engine hits, it's shedding parts, and then um, 
it finally, it actually pretty well rolls over as it sheds both wings. And if he had been able to hit a, a little bit more wings level, the chances of survival would have gone up. The biggest problem with this ditching is the fact that they catch that left wing. One can only imagine the pandemonium inside the airplane. Survivors report feeling a series of increasingly violent impacts. The plane first hit the water and it was, it was quite gentle. Then there was a hard bump. And the third one was like a like 60 mile an hour, worst thing you've ever felt kind of thing. Uh, and then it was getting progressively worse and the plane was like tumbling or something. And I said, that's it, I'm dead. Of 175 passengers and crew, 125 perish, including all three hijackers. Some victims are standing at the time of impact and are violently thrown to their deaths. Many die because they disregard safety instructions and inflate their life jackets while still inside the plane. As the cabin fills with water, they're pushed up against the ceiling and drown. But as tragic an outcome as it is, it could have been even worse. The fact that some people survive, is it good heroic piloting or were there mistakes made here? Were there mistakes? You can Monday morning quarterback this and say, well, they could have done this better, they could have done that better. But under the conditions that they faced, uh, I'd say this crew did pretty well. When we come back, how do young pilots prepare for future gut check moments? I'm about to find out for myself. Good. We're down. Yeah, that's it. You're we're in the down. water. We're down. We're down. We're down. Okay. Woo. That'll get your heart rate going. <laughs> Commercial jets are not designed to land on the water. It's dangerous and potentially deadly. So why would a pilot take such a risk? As we've seen, sometimes they simply have little choice. In one case, a giant 767 is felled by terrorists, hijackers who don't care if they or anyone else on board lives or dies. The pilot does his best to put the plane down safely. But the impact kills 125 people out of 175 on board. Over the Pacific Ocean, another flight has a mechanical problem and ends up in a virtual no man's land, too far to go back or forward. When the plane meets the water, there are violent consequences. The aircraft ends up in pieces. Miraculously, everyone on board survives. Over the Caribbean Sea, a DC-9 that's had a staggering chain reaction of bad weather and bad luck runs out of fuel. The violent impact kills 23 of 63 on board. And in the most famous case, a jet has the misfortune of running into a flock of Canada geese. All on board survive. What's the takeaway? If your plane runs into a situation where it may have to ditch, you want the right person in the cockpit making sound decisions. I just know that it took every bit of my education, training, and experience, along with that of my entire crew. I think we have nearly 140 years of experience at this airline, the five of us, to be able to, to come up with a number that was 155 on January 15th. The Flight 1549 incident and Sully Solenberg has gotten a lot of us thinking about experience. When we see very young people in the cockpit, what, what, what should we know about their, their training and their level of experience? I think the point is so much not how many hours someone has, but what's, what's happened during those hours? What kind of training has gone on? I visited the nation's oldest and largest aeronautical university, Embry-Riddle in Daytona Beach, Florida to see how tomorrow's pilots are being prepared for their own gut check moments. Students here are constantly drilled in just about every type of emergency that could, but rarely does, come up. So that when something does happen, it's sort of like muscle memory. They go back to a mental process they've already done before. If the engine does quit on a small airplane, they've already done it 15 times in the simulator and in the airplane as well. Coming up on 3,000. Both okay. the engines are going back. I we're feel like we're losing thrust. thrust. We're losing thrust. Although I'm not a licensed pilot, I've had plenty of flight instruction. I got the chance to land my own plane in the Hudson River. 
in one of the university's 36 flight simulators. I can tell you one thing, even in a training exercise, it's nerve wracking. Okay, so make okay. sure you're going to stall. Then I just That's drop right. the nose. Yep, drop the nose. You're okay. going to head for about 230 knots. Okay, I don't think we're going to make an airport. I see the Hudson River off. You're about 400 feet right now. Start leveling yeah. off. Good. Now back pressure. Good. We're down. There, that's it. You're we're in the down, water. We're down, we're down, we're down. Okay. Whew. That'll get your heart rate going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Six weeks after the real Hudson River ditching, the crew of U.S. Airways Flight 1549 testified before Congress. If the takeaway is about having the right person in the cockpit making the right decisions, airline professionals like Captain Chesley Sullenberger worry their industry is going in the wrong direction. If we do not sufficiently value the airline piloting profession and future pilots are less experienced and less skilled, it logically follows that we will see negative consequences to the flying public and to our country. With all respect to, to the captain, um, I'm kind of surrounded by a lot of young people, and, I, and they're 18 to 22, who all aspire to be at Captain Sullenberg's seat one day. I look at them at age 22, they're further along than I was, and I was a military aviator. When they get to be our age, they're going to be as good as we are, and probably a little bit better. Still, U.S. Airways First Officer Jeffrey Skiles, who sits in what he refers to as the right seat as a co-pilot, is troubled by the trend he says he sees of less experienced pilots being rushed into the cockpit before they may be ready. When we were brought up in the industry, you started out so you learned how to fly smaller airplanes, you worked your way up to bigger ones, but the smaller commuter uh, jets have the exact same complexity and speeds that we fly at, but people are essentially learning how to fly in six months and all of a sudden they're in the right seat of one of those airplanes. The standards uh, that the pilots meet and the training is still set by the, uh, the FAA and, it, and everybody of course has to meet that. But is there a, a lessening of experience across the industry? Yeah, there is. And uh, you don't find as many um, Sullenbergers today as you did 10 years ago. cameras and the latest military grade sonar to help him peer into deeper waters. Existing evidence of giant snakes is sparse. One of the earliest and most famous accounts comes from British explorer Percy Fawcett, who in 1907 says he encountered a 62-foot anaconda in Brazil. Later expeditions came back with fantastic stories of killer snakes. But more recently, this series of photographs surfaced on the internet. They appear to show a man swallowed whole by a giant python. But are these photos hoaxes or real evidence of giant man-eating snakes? Experts will analyze this evidence. If you look at the ribs, they are facing towards the back and that would be consistent with the snake swallowing towards the tail. The pythons in these photos are native to Asia and Africa, but there could be thousands of them right here in the United States, specifically in the Everglades of South Florida. This will be the site of another Monster Quest expedition. With more than one and a half million acres of wilderness, this is a perfect hiding place for giant snakes, as seen in these shocking pictures taken in 2005. You can see a 13-foot Burmese python split almost in two after swallowing an alligator whole. On the upper right is the snake's head, 
On the left, its tail. The alligator's tail protrudes from the snake. This is a big problem here in South Florida. And these are big snakes that can hurt a young child as well as a teenage boy or even a full-grown adult. Handling these snakes is dangerous, even for professionals. How did pythons native to Southeast Asia end up in these Miami neighborhoods? For many years now, these snakes have been very popular pets. Ron McGill of the Miami Metro Zoo has been studying Florida wildlife for nearly 30 years. The unfortunate thing is they purchase these animals when they're hatchlings or newborns in pet shops and they look very manageable. But when pythons get too big for their cages, owners release them into the Everglades. And in 1992, when Hurricane Andrew hit here, destroying homes and pet stores, hundreds of young pythons escaped into the wild. Nobody could have predicted what happened next. Because of our climate, it's so conducive to these animals when they are released or they escape that they prey on anything he wants. This snake could kill me that fast if it wanted to. Wildlife biologist Joe Wazalewski is no stranger to giant snakes. In 1989, he helped capture this 22-foot python, the biggest snake ever found in the United States. Now he's going to lead a hunt here in Florida to find a giant even bigger than that. Wazalewski believes that giant snakes are thriving in the Everglades and may start crossing into residential areas. Now he's looking for evidence. But snakes, even giant ones, are elusive. First, he will set up motion sensing cameras. You know, this is actually perfect. If I were to be a python in this neighborhood, this is where I'd want to be. Nice shaded houses all over. Everglades right there. This could be the spot. The place he's chosen is the border between the Everglades National Park